and good morning, everyone, and welcome to PerfWeb 94. I'm here with my terrific co-host, Thomas DeSalvio. Good morning, How are you? Everyone. Good morning. Hey, good to see you. It's good to good see you. All How right. So let's just jump right into it. Let's get those opening remarks done. Let's go with it right now. If you want to reach out to us, you have an idea, thought, you want to do a particular topic, you want to give a presentation, you want to come here and be live in the studio, whatever it may be, contact at perfusioneducation.com. Next on our list is our call-in number. Sometimes people do call in. It's rare, but when the phone rings, we get really excited around here. 832-239-5358. So our call, and there's our scroll bar down below. You can always find everything. Our call-in number's over there and all of our information on subscribing, liking, following, all of that stuff on the YouTube, the LinkedIn, X, and the uh, FaceTime. Okay, next, our critical care uh, app. It's got something weird on it there, Dave. But uh, not a worry at all. We're going to be using that app today. But if you want to get that app so you can use it with us right there, the QR codes, you can do that for the Google Play or for the uh, Apple if you have an iOS. All right. And our PerfWeb podcast. Look for us on your favorite uh, podcast streaming platform. Doesn't matter which one it is. Look up PerfWeb podcast series and you will get us and you can listen to us while you're stuck in traffic, whatever the case may be. We also have our hat here, Make Education Great Again. It's our mega hat. Thomas, you try it on, see how it fits. Hat. It is a beautiful hat. I have a small hat. It's this small. is a mega hat. It's a mega hat, and it's red. <coughs> That's perfect. There you go. You can wear that if you want yep. to today. And uh, let's see. Oh, I wanted to tell you one other thing. Thomas, why come to work for HET? And I'm going to pull up our HET, throw up our computer screen, if you will, share it. Go right here, HET.com. I mean, HET.us, not HET.com, <laughs> HET.us. And you can click on Contact Us right here and pull up a little thing there. It gives you a telephone number. You can send us an email, whatever it may be. But we are hiring. Okay, you could take that down. Perfect. We are hiring. Thomas, why come to work for HET? Because, because HET be... is our professional, our, right. our service provider. MediWeb is a different organization, right. but they do work together. You get to be around this wonderful man here. Yeah. That's the primary reason. I have learned so much in just a month. You know, when you think you kind of, when you achieve a level of just status quo, it's time to move on and, and, and be around people that are going to be able to bring you to the next level. And that's where... Joe is, is, is working towards helping me get that next level, and that's fantastic. These doctors are all fantastic. They're kind. Um, they are professional, and they're actually high-quality doctors, too. So you wouldn't have to worry about, you don't, we have good doctors. We have great nursing staff. Uh, everybody's very kind. They help you out when you need help. If you, if you need something, they'll go get it for you. Um, it's, it's a big family, too, and, and I, I've been very, very happy in the last three months that I've been here with Joe. And, and we get the opportunity for educational sharing, which is also something that I'm very big on. And I'm, I'm just very happy to be here. Well, I've learned a lot from you too. So I'll tell you that much. We learn from each other. And that's, that actually was part of my commencement address that I did up in Dallas uh, here a couple of weeks ago was we learned from each other. Right. So I've learned a great deal from you too. Um, would you say that, you know, the, the, the thing is, I think we're a small group and very uh, somewhat elite but uh, you touched on something about the, the family atmosphere. Mm -hmm. It may not be perfect for everyone, but for those people that I think m m are similar to us in philosophy, in really trying to achieve that level of professionalism in perfusion, this is a really good place to be. It is. But it's you have to be busy. really dedicated. You have to want this. It's not, it's not something that you're just going to walk <coughs> into and do your cases and go home. Um, you have to... That's hard to say. You, you want to you show up and you actually have to perform and do good and be willing to learn from, from Joe here. He'll teach you just a tremendous amount of stuff. And, and you came from the med center. Yeah, I came from the med center, and I'm very happy with the, the amount of stuff that I've learned just in this short period of time. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So, again, go to HET.us. If you're looking to move here to the Woodlands, it's a community north of uh, Houston, Houston yeah. and south of Conroe. It's beautiful. It's it got is. everything you could ever want without having to be in the uh, 
in the uh, uh, downtown really bad traffic area. Okay, let's just jump right on to damned if you do, don't, damned if you do, transfusion confusion. And this is a really good topic. Thank you. I, I, when I saw this, I was like, that is something we really need to address. Well, you know, it's so interesting because we've been belaboring this point, I hate to say, for about the past 20 years. Easily, yeah. Same conversations, and we still have gotten really no true consensus, but let's discuss it, and I think I have some perspectives that can explain why. Um, measured quality outcomes after cardiac, cardiac surgery, and this is a partial list, but what they're going to look at is survival at 30 days, early graft failure, reoperation, reexploration for whatever reason, delayed extubation, renal failure as defined, and I have the uh, I have that starred because that's defined by the STS, um, and it's a pretty tight definition. So renal failure is not necessarily end stage where they're going on dialysis, but any bump in the creatinine, it's about a half, uh, about point by, uh, by a uh, 50%, and you get in that qualification, I believe, right? Transfusions, big one, and I, I bolded it. Stroke, now there's stroke where you're, you have a hemiparesis, obvious stroke, but then there are subtle changes that happen neurologically as well that you have to take into consideration. Length of stay in the critical care unit, length of stay overall, and all of these things result in what is, in essence, increased cost. Now, 30 days survival, I mean, I think perfusion can have an impact on that. Early graft failure, probably not. That's a technical yeah. issue. Reoperation, exploration, we could have impact on that, but it's likely going to be a surgical problem, though it could be coagulopathy that we ourselves contributed to. Delayed extubation, I think we have impact on that. Renal failure, I think we have impact on that. Transfusions, we have impact on that. Stroke, you know, no, I really don't think that's us. I think that's cross, I think most strokes are caused by cross clamps and other things that we can cause them certainly, but generally those are because of incidents that occur that we are charged with guarding against. Then length of stay and length of stay for overall definitely contribute to that. So perfusion has a huge role in this, not the only role, but a huge role in this. Now let's talk about a whole blood. Blood comes in, starts off as whole blood, okay? And whole blood has all the goodies in it, right? And that gets then separated into packed cells, red cells, platelets, and plasma, FFP. The FFP, they extract the albumin from and the concentrated fibrinogen that we call cryoprecipitate. And these are referred to as here are reds and here are yellows okay so if you're ever doing an ftp uh, uh or uh, i'm sorry an mtp mass transfusion protocol you're going to want two reds two yellows you're going to want to switch back and forth and make sure that you give the patient's tank everything now if we only had whole blood it'd be great because it has all the goodies in it you could just do whole blood but that you're not going to find whole blood anymore because you make the blood banks make way more money Separating this it. technique than that technique okay so let's talk about our our system you're going to need this for as we move through this talk we have to have an oxygenator usually has an integrated arterial line filter centrifugal pump the cardioplegia in this scenarios, these scenarios that we're going to do are Del Nido or is Del Nido. We have eight foot three eighths ID arterial line. We have eight foot of half inch ID venous line. The total circuit static prime. Now, when I say static prime, that means the pump is not flowing. It's full. Your reservoir level is to zero. How much is in the circuit? but not in your reservoir. Now to run that pump, you need to have at least some level, minimum level. So you, I gave it 400 cc's. Do you mind if I ask a question? Please. What does ID stand for? Inner diameter. Okay. ID is inner diameter. So you can ask any question you want, yeah. Um, 
So the total dynamic prime, that means it's flowing and you have a level that is acceptable is 1300. So I gave you a 400 cc level in your reservoir. Uh, and del nido cardioplegia, we discussed, and ultrafiltration is available. So you're going to want those two, no, that number 1300 really is the number that you're going to want. So let's just ask, and Thomas, I'm going to drag you into this. Yay. I'm just going to ask very straightforward questions. Yes, Will this patient get transfused? 75-year-old male, 183 centimeters, 96 kilos, three-vessel CAD, plan is for a four-vessel cabbage, baseline H&H &H is 43 and 13.7, active lifestyle, well-nourished, hypertension, mild obesity, and you're not going to do any rep. Is that patient going to get transfused? On paper, no. Likely not. Even even on paper, but more than you have ultrafiltration available to you, though. You're not going to wrap, but you do have ultrafiltration available. The, I, I'm going to go into that case thinking to myself, unless something goes wrong, I'm not giving any blood. She's well nourished, active lifestyle, same day admit. How do you feel about? So I always tell people there's three, thing, three reasons why a patient would have a crit of 43. The first reason is that they live in Nepal. Mm -hmm. The second reason is they're an elite athlete and they train all the time and they've got lots of consumption, oxygen consumption going on, so their blood cells naturally create more crit. And lastly, you're dehydrated. So when I see that crit, I presume immediately that the patient is actually dehydrated. Or they have COPD, they could have that too. But what, what the key here though is, Active, active lifestyle stuff. and well-nourished. All he has is hypertension, hypertension, which is managed with some, and mild obesity. Mm -hmm. And that's only because these numbers say he's mildly obese, but it really isn't. So the answer is no. He, on paper, he's not going to get transfused. He's we'll, not we'll going to get, get transfused. The, yeah, we'll make it through the case. No Very problem. unlikely. Very unlikely, in my opinion. Now, let's make it a little more complicated. And you know what we could do? Well, we'll do it on this next one. Now, will this patient get transfused? 56-year-old female, 165 centimeters, 57 kilos, same three-vessel CAD, plan is a four-vessel cabbage, baseline H&H, &H, 34 and 11.5. She has a little bit of frailty, hypertension, but no CKD. Your anesthesiologist is going to say, let's go on bypass and see what we get. Uh huh. That's what Janice is also going to say. So, what do you think? Um, <laughs> with 1,300 cc's of prime, including drugs, fifty-fifty. Fifty-fifty. Yeah. I would agree with you on that, but let's look and see what the numbers actually say. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be important. So, I'm going to pull up our app. There we go. And I'm going to pull this up and we're going to do our perfusion quick calcs. It's a female. Okay, so it calculates the volume at 65 mLs per kilogram. She is 56 years old. She has a pre-op hematocrit of 34. She has a height of 165. Um, and her weight is 57. Pump prime is 1400 because we have to have that operating level anesthesia volume this is so yep. incredibly important is that 3411.5 a dry crit or is it a well hydrated crit and it's going to make a huge yep. difference so we're going to give the anesthesia volume one liter our pre-pump urine output was about 250 you can add that in at the very end i'm going to hit calculate so there's our bsa there's her BMI, and here is her estimated on pump crit is 21.51. Very, very much borderline. Now, if in a vacuum, that's all we need to worry about, fine. But we have to also worry about what her flows are going to be. How yeah. much drainage are we going to have? Is 1400 or 1300 cc's going to be enough or was she super hydrated not diuresed and we can actually pull some volume off all of those things are in question but 21.5 
Okay, I'm gonna leave that up for the time being and I'm gonna go back to my slides. And so this one, my view is no, I right. don't believe so. Anything can happen, but the likelihood is really slim in this with this patient kind of profile that we're looking at. This one, plus minus, maybe. I don't really know. Might be able to get them through it, but it's really, really hard to say. Yeah, you're probably not going to make your numbers for your DO2. Probably not, and that's a big issue. You are 100% correct on that. So many other things to, to worry about other than one, because I could get every one of these patients through with no blood right. and just don't flow, right? I could give them all, you know, 20 cc's per kilo of flow, and, 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 and that's going to be really bad for them, but I'll, I'll have a good crit. We won't transfuse the patient, but the outcome is going to be terrible. Now, let's look at this one. Will this patient get transfused? 64-year-old female, 165 and 57, three-vessel CAD with severe MR. Plan is a four-vessel cabbage with a mitral valve repair or replacement. God, I just hope it's a replacement, not a repair. Baseline H&H, &H, 28 and 9.4. She's frail, hypertension, CKD, di diabetes uh, type 2, and in congestive heart failure. Is this patient going to get transfused? Your anesthesiologist is going to say, let's wait and see what happens. Uh-huh. And what do you think? You're absolutely going to get transfused. And because you don't add blood to the prime, if you put two units in the prime, maybe even four units in the prime, those, just let's say you gave two, those two units in the prime will save you four in ICU. If you get four in the prime, that'll save you eight in ICU. And if you're forward thinking, would, would, this should be obvious. You're, gonna need, you're not gonna make any of the parameters for flows and your DO2, you're not gonna make it. And if, if you take the chance of just going on bypass with that 1400 cc's, you're, they're probably already dehydrated. You're just adding and compounding, your crit's gonna come back maybe 5.5. Well, let's see. 5 .5. Yeah, let's see what it's gonna be. I'm gonna pull the pull up. Do you think this patient should be on a pediatric circuit? You wouldn't, you could do that. And reduce the prime even more. Yeah. Now let's look at the numbers with and without wrap. True, because your flow rate's gonna be like what? 3.3, 3.5, I mean, mm -hmm. around there? The problem with the wrap in this is, in wrap, can cool. you wrap the entire circuit with a patient that size? Now, remember their mitral regurge, they're gonna have huge volume. You can wrap that patient. Their volume, guaranteed their volume overloaded. So let's take a look at this. It's a female. The female is 64 years old. The patient's pre-op crit is 28. She's 165 and 57. We're going to say we're going to wrap. We're going to give her, let's say we could get most of that 1,400 out. Let's say, how about 500? That seem fair? Let's go 500. You, okay. Let's just for, do it for, your, for, your for the sake of this discussion. Anesthesia is super restrictive. Yes. They're not giving her anything. Now they're tightening her up to give her blood pressure, but that's okay. Pre-pump urine, she's got CKD. It's 50 yeah. cc scant. Here we go. Even in that, look at that 23.55. That is the best case, case scenario. scenario. Now, what we haven't considered is we're going to give this patient del nido cardioplegia. So we're going to come back up here yep. and, and we're going to change this to 1500. Okay. And recalculate. And now n her crit is 19. Now gets better. We're going to have her uh, anesthesia gives more than that. They have to give her a liter, calculate. So pretty small amounts extra. Now her crit is 16. How are you going to achieve the DO2s that you need to do this case do and have any room for error? Now, the difference there is, what if this patient was so uber hypervolemic that we were able to remove, and I'm gonna go up here, to the pre-pump urine, and I'm gonna put in 2,500 of ultrafiltrate. Okay. And we still had enough volume. 
That's going to give us a crit of 28. But we're going to have enough bond to come off bypass with. That's I don't have enough. I don't have the answer to that. Uh, probably not. The, you'll, be, you'll be adding something. If not albumin or blood. Something. Okay. The illustration here is that each patient, well, we're going to talk about how we treat patients mm -hmm. as individuals or by numbers. This app is very useful. And by the way, you can go get this app. Don't forget, yep. Google Play. It's a great app. It's $2.99. It's got a lot to it. You can do a lot with it. So please use it. I actually have a lot of fun using the app because I'll put the number, I'll, I'll based on experience, <coughs> say what I think is going to happen. <coughs> and then I'll put the numbers in mm -hmm. and just see where I'm at. See what yes. the numbers say. You can do that and, and, and affirm that. Okay. So I, in my opinion, just looking at this patient, at some point in time in this patient's admission, they're going to get transfused. So I am going yeah. to put this as this patient yeah. is going to be transfused. And this patient's know, getting transfused yeah. in the operating and, room. And if you don't do it in the prime, two units in the prime will save you. It, on this patient, <coughs> maybe it'll save you four in the ICU. If you put four in the prime, this patient's gonna get like 10 units in ICU. And because it didn't happen in the OR, the anesthesiologist gets credited with a bloodless surgery right and exactly and it's all about getting dinged and we're going to talk yeah. about that a little bit more so here we go you're damned if you do you're damned if you don't it's either one or the other so when you give blood transfusion this is published data this comes from the indian journal of anesthesia there are three uh, types of transfusion morbidities or problems that can occur. They're acute, they're non-immune mediated, and they are delayed. In the acute phase, occurring uh, less than 24 hours, you have immune, immune mediated acute hemolytic transfusion reaction, which is the number one cause of death, believe it or not, in trans. Actually, the reason for that is it's clerical error. Clerical error is the number one cause of mortality in blood transfusions. You have febrile non-hemolytic reactions, urticaria, anaphylactic, um, transfusion-related acute lung injury, otherwise known as trally, and it describes over here the things that occur from that. You have non-immune mediated transfusion related sepsis, which is to say the blood products were contaminated with bacteria. Big problem with platelets. Non-immune hemolysis. You have transfusion associated circulatory overload, likely not going to happen while you're on bypass. Air embolism, likely not going to happen while you're on bypass. Then you have the delayed occurring greater than 24 hours. You have delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. You have alloimmunization to red cell antigens. You have transfusion associated graft versus host disease. You have post transfusion purpura and non immune mediated iron overload. So these are all the things that can happen or at least a portion of them many of the things with transfusions not to mention they're very expensive <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> in this article in circulation we look at infection and ischemia and over here is non-transfused and transfused so if the nadir hematocrit is less than 21 the lowest hematocrit and you do not transfuse that patient, you have a 1.9% increase in infection rate. But if you transfuse that patient, it goes to 12.2. For 21 to 24, you have a 4.1% increase from the anemia, but a transfused patient goes to 11.2. 24 to 27, 3.6, it's actually lower, which is sort of interesting. Okay. Um, and this is 14.4%. So each one of these, you see the non-transfused compared to the transfused, it is all worse in the transfused section. Now for ischemic events, the same phenomenon occurs with the same 21, 21, 24, so forth. 
you have a 1.9% increase if your crit gets below 21, 13.4 if you transfuse that patient, 3.3 versus 14.2, 3.4 versus 16.6, 3.5 versus 11.6. So you see very clearly on this slide in this study that transfusing a patient is bad. Is bad according to this that data, right? In comparison to not transfusing them with the same crits. And these are cardiac surgery patients, by the way. And here's the title: Red Cell Cell Transfusion in Patients Having Cardiac Surgery. Okay. Now here we're looking at infectious outcomes and ischemic outcomes and relative increase in cost. So on any patient uh, not the, the, that are gonna be uh, transfused uh, in total. Okay, so let's just look at zero. We're gonna start here. Obviously it's gonna be one, one, and one. That makes sense. You give one unit, your odds ratio of getting an infection goes to 1.46 ischemic 1.63, cost increase 1.11. Two units, 2.36, 2.30, 1 1.21. Three or four units, and you see where this is going, mm -hmm. all of them increase, 5.9, 10.75 increase for infection, 11.79 for ischemic, 1.81 increase in cost. And greater than nine units, you have a 45% chance of infection, 46% uh, for an ischemic event, and your costs increase by 3.35. So th this again demonstrates that giving patients transfusions is bad. bad. Yeah, I don't know how else to say it. And when we look at survival, this, uh, the, 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 uh, y-axis goes over time so time in years zero to seven mm -hmm. and your x-axis over here going to the uh, proportion dying from any cause any cause the solid line here is not transfused the solid line the dotted line here dashed line is transfused and you see over time the gap between patients and transfused or not transfused and survival so your survival curve is clearly better in patients not transfused right. or worse in patients that were transfused. So in conclusion, in this particular article, RBC transfusion appears to be harmful for almost all cardiac surgery patients and wastes a scarce commodity and other health service resources. <laughs> These are the author's <laughs> words. It is difficult to identify patients in whom transfusion is truly necessary on the basis of hematocrit age and comorbidity. This study reinforces the need for prospective evaluation of restrictive transfusion triggers and objective clinical indicators for RBC transfusion in cardiac surgical patients. This deserves a double goat. <laughs> mm -hmm. I frankly, and I'm not sure, Thomas, I'd like your opinion on this. I, I find this statement um, somewhat irresponsible, it's, in my view. It's a terrible statement, mm -hmm. that, especially the middle one where they say that, that um, it's a waste of a scarce commodity. Mm -hmm. um, I always say, it's kind of like, if you're gonna have a football team, you gotta have good players, and you gotta have good equipment. And one of the tools of perfusion is blood, transfusion. And we, are, we don't operate on people because we feel like it. They're sick and they need surgery. And oftentimes whether the surgery has, the patient already needed blood to begin with. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, have, I, have, I also have some ideas on you know, like things you, sh you can think about whenever you are giving blood that may contradict you for giving blood. But, but the majority of time, what we're talking about is a patient that already needs red cells or pro and probably platelets and FFP. And to say something like that is just, just to take away your, one of your tools. Mm -hmm. You can't play the game. You know, one of the things that I didn't say in, the, uh, in one of my previous slides 
on that patient with the uh, mitral regurgitation, the, the MVR, and had CKD and other issues, is she is not going to produce red blood cells right. at the same rate that a younger person or we yeah. are going to do even so, at our age. Right, it's, I call it the little old lady factor. And that actually should be, a, I, it, in my mind, it's a clinical diagnosis. When you L-O-L-F. See yeah. The LOLF. Look, little old lady factor. Yeah, I gotta remember that, that's and, true. And when you, they, they're frail, they're, red, they're, they're just older, and so cells aren't being produced as quickly. Um, things like 2,3-DPG, which will become very important in, in later on if, if I get the chance to talk about that. But they're, they're not making these things, and so we need to artificially give it to them via a donated blood product. Mm, and agreed. the other thing that was interesting to me is that in the last sentence where he says that, um, made a second sentence, where he said that comorbidity, and I, I think that that's probably the biggest factor there, because comorbidity by itself is a reason to give blood and yes. to maintain high hematocrits and high hemoglobins. And you know, the, the deal that a seven, hemoglobin of seven on pump or 21 crit, it's too low. And you can't, we, you can't to, in order to meet a DO2, which we're trying to cure you know, kidney, kidney uh, malfunctions at post-surgery, saying that, the, and blaming it on DO2, you can't flow high enough mm -hmm. to, to compensate for the the low crit. You have to have a crit of 10. I mean, a hemoglobin of 10. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about yeah. that as a matter and of so fact. So they put it in there, but they, they back talked. And that's not, that's not. Yeah, it is contradictory. Mm -hmm. But I also think that these conclusions concern me because I do think that there are people who, you look, I can probably take you and get you through a pump run and these good docs can probably get you through the ICU and onto the floor, you may have a little more, um, uh, uh, you know, delayed sort of recovery back to normal. You'll struggle a little bit, but we'll probably get you through, even if something were to have happened and we, your, your, your hematocrit ended up 16, 17, 18 maybe, but it's probably even 16, probably get you through it. Right. You're young enough, you're healthy enough, you can get through it. But each patient, has what is their underlying problem and what are their we're going, to, we're going to talk about my axioms as we move forward but you can't look at a patient and say this patient at 75 years old sedentary lifestyle frail um still mentally you know yeah, sharp, sharp yeah. i mean either we're going to say we're not going to operate on those people or we're going to reconsider these kinds of opinions, but it's gotta be one or the other. Right. We can't operate on the type right. of people we operate on and expect there to d not to give blood. Yeah, it, it always makes me kind of laugh because they expect me to maintain a DO2 of 270, but they won't give me the tool that I need to maintain that. Right. And then, I don't know. Or DO2I, yeah, DO2I DO2 of yeah. 270. Okay, so now let's just make this all even more confusing. Anemia in cardiac surgery. Can something bad get worse? So RBC transfusion for patients, and this is a separate article, who underwent cabbage with CPB was associated with a 50% increased risk of mortality and or complications. Additional transfusion was associated with an even bigger risk in patients with anemia that did not receive transfusion. The risk was comparable to non-anemic patients that were not transfused. So in this article published in 2021 in the Brazilian Journal of Cardiovascular Surgery, it supports the previous studies. There's a lot of data out there that strongly suggests that transfusions really are bad and we give transfusions when we shouldn't be giving transfusions. And it's from all over the globe, here in the United States, in, in uh, Asia, and in uh, South America. It's very interesting. Well, kind of, maybe everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. Somebody said this at some point and then uh, everybody just agreed with them. And so now everybody's looking to confirm that this is true. And, you know, for us to look at this and say it's not true, mm -hmm. that this is, these studies are flawed, they're not giving you, they're not including the real data and the real outcomes and the real fact that these patients 
are, they have comorbidities and they're sick and we're, we're going to end up giving them blood mm -hmm. and maybe they die sooner, but it's not so much because we gave them the blood. It's also because of all the comorbidities. Very, that's death. such a good <laughs> so, point. The reason they needed the blood to start with, and that's never factored into it. So look to your point, what we ended up with was for profit companies and organizations exactly. populating all over the place, tremendous pressure on healthcare providers to reduce transfusions. It's part of the CMS and STS quality measures and the pay for performance model. The less transfusions you give in your institution or to your patients, the more you get paid. Awesome. Um, yeah. Then it of course initiated this whole idea of RAP uh, versus just standard ultrafiltration, which of course, you know, my opinion <laughs> on that. And of course, then minimum prime circuits, which is about the only thing in this entire thing that I actually do think would make more sense is right. min our true minimum prime circuits. Now, MEC, the, uh, the closed circuit, that's kind of questionable, kind of hard to do coronaries with that, probably even hard to do valves, a true closed circuit, yeah. no reservoir. Yeah using the patient as a reservoir. People do it and they're pretty successful, but I, 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 I don't know if we could do it with our patient population. More, it, it's used more in Europe, but they have much smaller patients. But it also resulted in these organizations, SABM, AABB, mm -hmm. and the PBM. And you know what these guys all do? You know what they do? They make money. Right. It's all about the dollars. That's what it's about. That's my opinion about that. So, now we did the damned if you do, but are we still damned if we don't? Not according to that information nope. we just reviewed. Preoperative anemia increases mortality and postoperative morbidity after cardiac surgery. So we're gonna look at most of these slides that I'm gonna show you from right to left. The solid line is male, the dotted line is female, both of them follow the same basic yeah. curve. The lower your pre-op hemoglobin, the higher your risk of probability of death, your, your risk of mortality. So, and that's, you know, you start off with a hematocrit of 14, you have a far lower incidence or risk of mortality than if you start off with 8.4, which is gonna be up here, okay? Nader hematocrit, meaning the lowest hematocrit, right? During cardiopulmonary bypass, end organ dysfunction and mortality. Published in the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery. We're gonna look at all of these from right to left again. Your hematocrit from low, from high rather, to low, and the increase of the occurrence your troponin, which would be an ischemic event, higher hematocrit to lower makes it worse. Estimated GFR, higher hematocrit to lower makes it worse. Ventilatory support from higher to lower makes it worse. ICU length of stay, higher to lower makes it worse. Hospital stay, Higher to lower makes it longer. Three years survival, look at this. Woo, straight down. Yep. And then we came up with goal-directed perfusion. Mm -hmm. And goal-directed perfusion, according to the study published in Journal of Extracorporeal Technology, recently in uh, no, uh, June of 2022, just a year ago, a little over a year ago, Goal-directed perfusion is not associated with a decrease in acute kidney injury in patients predicted to be at high risk for acute renal failure after cardiac surgery. And the reason I put this in here is because we have this magical number of 270. And what I believe this illustrates is the uniqueness of each patient. And I think that's something that I really wanted to be able to discuss. And these are some pretty serious uh, 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 authors, by the way. You know, Bob Groom's been around forever. Um, uh, Lucas has been around. I've seen his uh, work before. Um, 
I don't know Monica, but I do know Bob. Uh, but I mean, these are two, these guys do a lot of publishing. Um, and what I think it shows in this analysis, the use of GDP, gold directed patients who had high risk for acute renal failure was not associated with a decrease in AKI when compared to the historical cohort managed traditionally with CPB flows based on BSA. In fact, the GDP cohort performed worse than the retrospective control group in terms of ARF mortality and intensive care unit admission. Unlike what was found in lower risk patients, there does not appear to be any reduction in AKI in patients at high risk for acute renal failure. And this is because the patient has a morbidity, has a comorbidity. Mm -hmm. a, they have acute kidney injury, preoperatively, they're high risk. They are on the, they're teetering. You can do all you want to do. Trans, now, if this patient had gotten armed into a transfusion group, is it the blood that caused the problem or is it because they were at high risk for having renal failure already? And if they are going to go into renal failure, would they have gone in renal failure anyway? And based on this data, they would have if you let the hematocrit fall to 18, 17, 16, maybe even 20, I don't know. But this is the issue, and I think this article illustrates it, is that we have to recognize that each patient is unique and has to be treated individually, not by algorithm. That's what I believe fundamentally. And Thoughts? That, yes, that, that comes with experience and uh, getting rid of the bias that blood is bad. And that's, anemia is bad. Yeah, anemia is Blood's worse. bad. Anemia is bad. Did you see those numbers? They're, yeah, the numbers, are, the numbers speak for themselves. But we all, we all know that. But unfortunately, knowing that, still people resist to, to fix it. it, doesn't it is, is it not a parallel to our news we watch the news, we believe. You believe blood is bad and my goal in life is to have a, 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 a PBM program here at my hospital and we're gonna do nothing but three vessel. They were at the beach playing volleyball yesterday, coronaries, and we're gonna hold a banner up and pull it up and say, see, we can do bloodless cardiac surgery. Well, come here and do some of our cases and see if that, that plays out, because it will not play out. Geographically, it matters. The patient population, your patient uh, uh, mix matters. Your selectivity matters. We could do bloodless surgery all day long, barring any kind of problem that might occur, we can, if we only operate on healthy patients. And we get to say, we get to have a commercial that says we did bloodless surgery. Right. Um, I had a good point, but I forgot it. Okay, well, so maybe we it'll come back yeah. to you. So, Joe's axioms, this I view as commonsensical. Trying to wean a patient from bypass with a pre-op low ejection fraction after a prolonged cross-clamp time and a hematocrit of less than eight, and I really think it's less than 10, but I put less than eight yeah. just to be, just to be, liberal here is going to go poorly the lower the oxygen capacity the harder the heart muscle must work to compensate oxygen delivery depends on oxygen capacity severe hemodilutional anemia is not isolated to red blood cells meaning you're diluting the platelets you're diluting the plasma you're diluting everything every patient presents their unique characteristics and the decision to transfuse or not should be made by should not be made by algorithm alone smaller circuits are better Ultrafiltration is good. Correct the albumin. Mm. If the flow must be reduced below an acceptable DO2 to facilitate the surgery, either increase the O2 capacity or decrease O2 demand. Drop the temperature. Do something. 
Don't just run at low flow at 36 or 37 degrees or 35 degrees for any protracted period of time if you know the patient's oxygen demand is increased because of the temperature and you are not flowing enough. Don't let your patients get an elevated lactate. Don't let them live in, 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 in an ischemic environment or a, an anaerobic environment. It's not healthy for them. It's really bad. I guess when you have to flow low and when you have to deal with these situations because you know you're getting close to coming off pump um, and you need to be warm, you compensate. I use the word compensate. I used to say cheat, but uh, people didn't really like it. So rule number one of perfusion is cheat. <laughs> But yes, no, but it, it's actually compensate, you know, so what you're going to do, you know, you're flowing low, you know, the body's taking a hit and the brain is taking a hit. So let's raise our CO2 up to 50 or 52 and try to get some, some get, get the brain, mm -hmm. protect the brain first. That's probably should be our motto. Protect the brain first. And it's the most sensitive of the organs. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, it's the one that is the most obvious that you've had a problem when your patient wakes up. That's true. Agreed. Agreed. And people can tolerate a lot. People yeah. can take a lot yes, of insult and do well, but it's this, this very, very thin line. It's almost invisible. Like you can do so much to a person and they'll come back from the <laughs> precipice of, 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 of death. But that just one more thing and there's never coming back just over the cliff and that's yep. all there is to it so those are my slides do we have any questions from the audience by any chance no yet not yet not yet okay well, so so your thoughts first thought you know albumin is probably the most <clears throat> underutilized i almost go before thing that we have in perfusion and you know you when you, when you look at your albumin and it is 3.4, that's too low. And that is going to cause third spacing and it's gonna just exasperate all your problems with your, with your hematic rate and your hemoglobin. I've seen them 1.9. Yeah. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody somewhere did a study and they found that if they gave albumin at, at not much, minimum level is like, like 20 grams, 25 grams, that there was some kind of a lung uh, congestion that occurred. And, you know, no, I disagree with that because we need it in perfusion. This is a tool and you need albumin, you need a high albumin, 4.4, you know, 4.5. Agreed. So the other thing I want to say is that the timing of giving blood is extremely important. If you give, if you prime, if you give, go on bypass with 1400 cc's of crystalloid end drugs and then give two units of blood, you're behind and you're going to get four units of blood or eight units of blood in ICU. Got Especially it. if you're not ultrafiltrating. Yes. It all comes down to are you ultrafiltrating that patient? That matters so much. And the next thing I would say is when you're weaning from bypass, I don't know how many times that I've been given blood, we're weaning from bypass, we don't have enough volume to come off, and the anesthesiologist at that point gives me blood. And I look at them and I say, can't we just come off bypass first and then you give the blood? after we're off bypass because now that blood has gone into the circuit and dilutionalized versus if we come off bypass and give the blood as fast as we can through the through the anesthetic lines it's higher concentration and that's that's an important so timing is yeah come off timing. light and give that yeah and the other thing i want to discuss is so you know clerical errors are important and the, the most primary thing you do when you give blood when, when you are handed blood, it's supposedly been checked by a billion people. The nurses have scanned it in. It's all been checked off. I've had two significant events in my career where I was, I've been given wrong blood. Mm. And had I just given the blood, and through all those checks, all of those checks, and you sit there and go, so number one, when you get a unit of blood, you always check the patient's name. Make sure it checks with your names that you have, the actual patient name. Number two is the expiration date. You gotta look at the expiration date. And then number three, is the blood compatible with the patient's blood? And, and there's those three things, it's not like in order, they're all equally important. So you, you simply cannot just trust that the blood, or be in a rush, you know, like, oh my God, we've gotta get this blood, we need to get in there. Always take that little bit of extra time, because these errors happen, and they're, they result in death. I mean, 
if you if you cross match blood wrong, it's bad. It's very very bad. Mm -hmm. Now here recently, I was given a unit of blood that had a, had a, a female patient who was uh, she was about sixty, I believe, and uh, she was a negative, mm -hmm. and they gave me a positive right. blood, right. and I was like, well, wait a minute. Uh, she's a negative. Can we give her this? And they're, you know, we. I said, they yep. said, yeah, it's it's her blood. I mean, it's been checked. It's been. I said, this is called the blood bank and ask. So the new policy is, if they are of non childbearing right. age, right. you can give the positive to the negative. Um, so that whole thing has kind of gone out the window there. Right. But the Rh factor is important because clearly, you can't, and and when you give somebody positive blood that's negative they convert to positive mm -hmm. and that's you know that's that's the real thing and so and most of our patients are older and they're not going to be having kids and so that's but even with they're younger that's something to really really think about i agree with that a lot so the other thing to think about that i that i've written down is um and i don't remember where i, I don't know how i know all the things that i know and and i read a study somewhere and during my during being around and perfusion and within three days 50% of 2,3-DPG disappears from red cells. And then after seven days of being out of the patient's body, it's like 75%. So when you give red cells, you are, especially when they're older, you want to have the youngest red cells you can give, but when they're older, you're looking at giving more of an oncotic fluid. So you, you are getting the pull back from third space and getting the pull back into the system without giving um, um, a non heme right and also the interesting thing to me was how quickly that this lack of 2,3 DPG converts so pretty quickly within it's, it is days though and that's the interesting is that so you, this blood could be circulating around and actually be bound have oxygen bound to it but it can't release it and mm -hmm. that's the primary thing of 2,3 DPG its job is to release the oxygen so, but it's still performing a job, and with pretty quickly, it will gather back the 2,3-DPG and become viable. Well, viscosity is very important, I mean, in so many different ways. And, of course, you know, blood is our best buffer. Blood in, is our best viscosity, right, uh, element. And so your blood pressure, instead of giving the patient vasopressin, maybe we should give the patient a unit of pack cells and get some viscosity because that will affect our blood pressure and give us a better blood pressure right mm -hmm. and the other you're thing circulating was, water around it doesn't work too well no, it, doesn't, it doesn't help and the other thing there's two other things i was going to talk about one was these are living cells that are being put into another person's body and one of my uh proctors from along from a while back he said that it's like giving a an organ transplant it's a tissue transplantation it, agreed and it pretty much is so there's risks with that and we do the best we can with, with making sure that everything's compatible. And just, that's just something that some people would look at and say, maybe we should not be given blood cells. Um, then the last thing is, it's just the ooh factor. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, ooh, like somebody else's blood is inside of me. Mm -hmm. But the diff you, you can't look at it like that. You have to look at it like, I'm alive now mm -hmm. and I get to live. Mm -hmm. and, th and those are some big things to think about that people probably can, those are real things. Everything that was going on in the study was not, not, it was not, not good. These are real things that you would say, okay, maybe we, you could fight against putting red cells in. But even, even with these, there, it's, the answer is still no. We have to give red cells. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Th I think that, I think you have to, as I said, look at each patient individually. I think if you have a patient that has a compromised DF, they're really just, their heart is just really beat up. Um, we're going to be revascularizing it or putting a new valve in or whatever the case may be. The better, the higher that hematocrit is to come off bypass, and I prefer to have the, the, the hemoglobin 10 or above, yeah, yeah. the much more likely that patient is going to do well in the short term. I've seen too many times of trying to come off bypass with a hematic with a hemoglobin of seven that with that same patient and failing and the next thing you know you're going on balloon pump and then the next thing you know you're going on ECMO and the next thing you know you're giving that patient way more blood 
than you would have given them had you just given them the blood from the start. Right. So I think that phenomenon exists as well, is that we give way more blood than we had to because we waited to give it. Yep. Mm -hmm. So two units in the prime will save you four to eight in ICU. I believe that. And that's, that's just what I always tell people. Um, I, w I would ask you, what do you think about this red cell content and the higher hemoglobins and SVR and coming off bypass? Yeah, so, you know, so are you Professor, asking how I terminate bypass? Right, right. So, and, and how would you incorporate um, hemoglobin into this formula? Sure. I mean, I think so. I mean, if, so to, to measure SVR is very easy, right? right? I mean, the formula is a little bit cumbersome, I guess, when you think about it, because the technical formula for SVR is mean arterial pressure mm -hmm. minus CVP times 79.9 divided by the cardiac output. So when I do SVR and I'm on bypass, I am on full bypass, getting ready to thinking about coming off, not with the heart partially filled. I just make sure that I'm completely empty. The heart is empty. My CVP is going to be zero. So I take my mean arterial pressure. It's 70. I have uh, zero CVP. So it still says 70. I don't multiply it by 79.9. I multiply it by 80. Makes it a lot easier. Seven eighths are 56. So 5,600 divided by the cardiac output is going, and say I'm flowing, uh, we'll just use four liters. Mm -hmm. I can off the top of my head say that my SVR is probably 1,400. Just guessing those numbers. Okay, right. that's just a guess. But it's probably pretty close. What does the math actually work out to be? So, um using Thomas Isms, I cheated. Okay. I, I, tried, I tried to make the formula a simpler thing than trying to say, oh my God, I gotta multiply it times 80 and I gotta divide it by, you know, all these things. So what I came up with was, and I, to tell you the truth, I haven't done this. This is an excellent opportunity for everybody who's, who's out there that's watching us. Oh, by the way. Take Do you wanna draw that? Do you wanna have that on, on, on you could draw that on here. Yeah, by Here, the way, take look. this time to like and subscribe to this video. So this is real, it helps I love the algorithm. Thank you. And it, it, um, it really helps us get the word out about you know, the provision education that we are, we are um, trying to do here at, at, at HT. Um, here, let me do this. Hold on. I'm going to give yeah. you a blank slate so that you can, so that you can uh, draw. And let me just go here. And I want to delete this. How do I delete this? Hey, Dave, anybody can help me or no? Or I need to delete this picture. I just want to cut it. Oh, that's probably a good idea. Um, insert. Oh. Okay. Insert. Yeah, it's not giving me that option. Mm -hmm. Home. Review. View. Do you know how to do this, uh, Magic, or anybody? Can help me or no? I just want to pull up a slide with nothing on it. This is magic. He's our behind the scenes guy. He works Slide very hard. And he's an I just want to get rid of this. As well as a, uh, one of That's our all I want to do. Fusionists. While they're working on that, we can talk about the formula a little bit. What I'm trying to do is to just build a chart and be able to say that if the, uh, the, arterial pressure minus the CVP is a certain number, say 70, and the flow is 4.5, the uh -huh. SVR will be 1242. Here's another account. And what we're trying to maintain, this is, Joe just taught me this, and it's, it's absolutely brilliant uh, for coming for weaning from bypass, predicting your, your capability of weaning from bypass, and that is we wanna have an SVR greater than 1,000. So what we wanna do is to try to make a chart where the bottom number doesn't change. The flow is 4.5. And then it's a question of, is that arterial pressure 
minus the CVP times 80, is that number going to be 70 for your, and, and forget about the 79.8.9, just, be, it would just be the arterial pressure minus the CVP. So if you get the number 70 and you're flowing 4.5, your SVR is 1242. Well, what if you had the number 70, but you're flowing four? What would your, what would your number be? And what I'm trying to do is build a chart where Delete. I can find in a stair-step yeah. pattern where the 1,000 mark Just is. And I'm automatically be able to look at it and say, blood pressure minus CVP is 70, flow is three. Yeah, let me do it. We need to be flowing Perfect, you at, got it. Dude, you're a genius. We need to have a, your, your, your um, SBR is going to be, what, I don't know, probably, if you're flowing three, it's probably gonna be like, Okay, here. 800 or something like that. Can you pull the low. iPad up? Here's a pen. Pen, okay. There. And make it full screen. There. Wow, okay. Great job, guys. Thank you. So the formula starts off like this. It's your mean arterial minus your CVP, and then times, we're gonna call it 80, and you divide this whole thing by your cardiac output. And what I'm trying to do is, the first thing I tried to do <coughs> was solve for, was get rid of the 80. And I ended up with, let's see, if we got rid of the 80 there, we ended up with one over 80 equals, X minus CVP. So that's what I started off trying to do. But in the end, what I'm trying to do, what we're going to do is we're going to take these numbers and we're going to be able to say and put it into a formula, not a formula, a, a grid, where we know that this, anything above here is 1,000. You can get rid of the other no, marks, you know. How do you do that? Here, look. You go here. I have to turn it a little bit, sorry. You hit eraser. And you just do like that. Yeah. I'm messing up your marks, so I'll just mess we'll, it all we'll start up. It up yeah. yeah, there. Okay, and then go back to your pen here and your pen there. Mm, awesome. So we're gonna take this and put it into, put the formula in and do it and we're gonna make a grid that we can actually just store on the pump and, it, and what it takes to get to 1,000 SBR using just flow rate on this side, I think. So if the flow rate is three, four, five, six, seven, and on the bottom side would be what your arterial number is. Or you, you can make them be, they can, I, they can transpose sides, I guess. So if your pressure, if you end up with that arterial pressure minus CVP of being, say, 70, and that's actually a good number, because a lot of times I'm dealing with like a 50. I've got a, a mean blood pressure of 50 minus a CVP of, of zero. So I'm already, I already know this patient is gonna have, a, we're gonna have a tough time coming off pump. We're gonna be adding volume. We're going to be doing, it's going to be a problem. You're but, vasodilated. Yeah. And so we'll be able to put this into a, a chart, like a grid, where, of course, the numbers will get bigger as we go this direction. And on the various flow rates, match them. So we can say at 7 and 60, we're, we're above 1,000. And we make a chart that we can just put on the pump, or we can publish it with our, with, with our, with us. A with flow at 6. Yeah with a mean arterial of 70, right. CVP is zero, we're gonna be, so let's see, you'll, six. You'll have, a good, you'll have a good enough crit, so good enough SBR. Six liters times 70, mm -hmm. 70, six sevens are 42, that's 4,200, divided by the uh, cardiac output, which is, where, where was the, car? so it was, no, it was a mean pressure of 70. Right. So 70 times 80 is 560, 5,600, divided by six. So it's pretty close, but it's not quite, it's about 900. So we're too low. We need a little to, too we low. We need to raise the pressure a little bit. Yes. 
So I just take or increase this is this is this would be a cool nomogram to have, but every perfusionist should be able to go and then all you have to do is go over here, click this button here, hit clear pen markings, and it clears it right off. That's awesome, yeah. So, so yeah, you need you need a you need a class we need to do a class on the iPad. Mm -hmm. So it's for me it's very easy. I'm getting ready to come off bypass. I've ultra filtrated, I've tried to concentrate what I have in the reservoir because I know once I am done. We'll have zero volume in that reservoir. I got 900 more cc's, probably about 20%, mm -hmm. 15, 20% of that patient's entire blood volume just in the lines because I know what right. my static prime is. So I get my volume where I want it. I get my crit as high as I possibly mm -hmm. can. I quickly look up. I'm flowing five liters. I've got a mean arterial pressure of 80. 80 times 80, 88 or 6,400 at five liters. I'm probably 11, 1,200. That's a lot of math. And I really know good. <laughs> they're going to delete. Yeah, it's very easy to do. It's very easy. You, you, you look at your mean pressure. Mm -hmm. Your mean pressure is 70. Seven eights are 56 divided by a cardiac output of five. It's just a little over 1,000, probably 1,100. I'm going to be happy with that. And then I start to slowly fill, but I don't ever try to come off bypass with an SVR of 500 or 600. I'm not going to come off. I'm not going to have enough volume. I'm going to have to over dilute that patient. And it's not where the patient needs to be. We don't walk around with an SVR of 500. We walk around with an SVR somewhere between 800 to 1200 about where we're at, probably closer to, tw probably 1,000, 1,200, 1,400, probably pretty reasonable. So, you know, I mean, those are realities. So what, what impressed me so much about your, your philosophy on this, and I watched it in action, was the number one predictor for successful weaning from cardiopulmonary bypass has always been, in my opinion, the way I teach people, um, your baseline ejection fraction. So if you've got an eject, because usually you can't do cardiac outputs because a lot of people are not using the swan GAN systems to do that. But um, so, you, so you look at the ejection fraction, anything less than 30, and you know you're, if you're closer to 30 and up, you know 30 is per baseline, but once you start going below 30, you know you're gonna have trouble winning from bypass. So again, we're gonna cheat, um, uh, compensate, sorry. And we're going to now use SVR to take us that extra step to compensate for the low ejection fraction pre-op and tune the patient for weaning from bypass. Yeah, you have to optimize. Yeah. You have and to optimize the patient to I come off bypass. I don't think that any, I don't, I, I don't think that anesthesiologists or surgeons have been taught this kind of thing and they, so they're not gonna be much help for you. This is gonna be all on the perfusionist to hemoconcentrate as much as you can to raise the crit up and to um, tighten the patient. And the problem with tighten the patient though from the perfusionist end is the anesthesiologist does not know how much you're giving. And so they have drugs set up and ready to go for typical levels or for what maintaining where they're at, but they don't know that you've been given all these drugs. So you need to stop giving drugs at least five minutes before weaning and let anesthesia take over. So they're prepared for when the weaning, when the weaning stops and those drugs that you were given stop. You should never be given drugs beyond in at least five minutes coming off bypass. Now, I, I have to admit, I disagree with you on that. Okay. I don't want anesthesia giving anything until we've come off bypass. So, because I, I have so much easier control over everything. So I will usually treat the patient up to the minute where I'm gonna clamp the venous line. Okay. So what I normally do is, I start off with the uh, uh, flow. I'll reduce the flow down to, for let's say I'm flowing five liters. I'll reduce the flow by 50%. Mm -hmm. I'll go to two and a half liters of flow and I will simply clamp my venous line. I don't wean right. per se. And as I start to see arterial ejections, I will reduce that flow and keep turning it down until I'm flowing maybe 500 cc's, maybe 1,000 cc's per minute. And I watch, and once my systolic pressure does not increase for any aliquot of volume, that's where I stop. The patient is now at the peak hmm. of their starling curve. Right. Any more volume will only serve to hurt that right. patient. 
So then I wait and I let's see what this patient's going to do. Anesthesia starting their medications if necessary. And if not, as they continue to mobilize, I can start giving more volume. My goal when I come off bypass is to have only enough volume in my reservoir to fill the patients enough to come off bypass, not stay off bypass, but come off bypass. As the patient needs more volume, mm -hmm. I am flushing everything from my circuit into the patient. Right. When they take that arterial cannula out of the aorta, I want it to be Kool-Aid. That's all that's there because I've given everything back to yeah. the patient. If I have more than one unit of cell saver at the end of the case, I feel like I have not done the best possible yeah. job I can I th do. I think that's a, that's a very, very good statement. I, I actually did that the other day and um, the, the surgeon, they were discussing how much, um, how much cell saver did you add? And I told him none. And he turned around and he looked at me. How come you don't have any cell saver? And I said, well, we put it all into the patient. He goes, oh yeah, that's right, you told me that. And, and that was actually what, I, probably the best weaning I've ever done. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that was one of the, and, and I've, been, I've been in this for you know, a long time and I take great pride in my ability to wean patients and, and understand filling pressures. And you know, every time I get better and better and better, but I guarantee this SBR concept, you know, and what I wanted to bring it back to you was our main topic, which is, you know, to give red cells or to not give red cells. And it does come down to hemoconcentrating, high albumin, red cells, SVR, pre-op ejection fraction. And, and flow the patient. Yes. Do you know what the best, you know, here's another one of Joe's axioms. What is the best treatment for uh, hypotension? I think increase your flow. Better flow, exactly. Yay. The best, I, the best <laughs> treatment for a low blood pressure is increased cardiac output. Yes. Now, that's not to say a patient who's vasoplegic or has severe vasodilatory right. effect from something. We're not talking about that. Within somewhat normal parameters of SVR, the best treatment for a low blood pressure is increased cardiac output. And what's interesting is that I've been called into, into the room before where a perfusionist uh, was having a major problem with blood pressure issues. And I learned this from Dr. Gerald Laurie at Methodist in, in Medical mm -hmm. Center. And he's done a few cases. Yeah, just, yeah. Mm -hmm. just he did Barbara Bush's valve. Really? Yes. He's done some, some, some mm -hmm. high power people's he has. cases. I'm not allowed to talk about. But mm -hmm. well, everybody knows it. I mean, Barbara Bush, it was public knowledge that she had heart surgery. Some people it isn't. So the, but the whole that, world knew. Yeah. Okay. She lived. She did. And <laughs> Way to go, Doc. <laughs> because he's like brilliant in mitral valves. But nonetheless, the, the major thing is that in, a, in a, a, situa a vasoplegic situation where it's a spiral, you, you're not flowing enough, and then the, the, the systemic, the volume inside of the capillaries just dilates, and then you flow less because you have, you, the volume stays in the patient, it's not coming back to you, and you're having to flow less, and it causes this spiral of, of vasoplegia. Well, the solution to it, and it's kind of, unfortunate sometimes, but is just to flat out drop one to two liters of crystalloid. Get the volume in there and push this into the patient and get those flows up and dump a bunch of norepi or neo, whatever, or um, um, the other one. Vasopressin, yeah, yeah, phen phenyl levofed, yeah. neo. Just put that stuff in there, squeeze them hard and get those flows up. And then after you've done all that, now you've caused a trauma. <laughs> so, because you've, you've had a massive vasodilate, no, um, a massive um, hemodilution event, but at least you got your SR, SBR up and you got, you got the flows reestablished and you fixed the vasoplegia crisis. Now at this point, you start hemoconcentrating and you start worrying about all the damage that you've done, but it got you through the crisis. Yes, you have to break the cycle. Yeah. You have to break the downward spiral. I totally agree with that 100%. Yeah. Okay, well, this has been fun. Question. Oh, question, shoot. Where is the SVR target of a thousand born from? That's a good question. Um, it's normal physiology. Guyton's physiology book. If you go to Guyton's physiology book and you Guyton? look up Guyton, G-U-Y-T-O-N. Okay. If you go to Guyton's physiology book, you will find a section that describes normal, normal. human physiology uh, vascular tone and SVR is in there along with the formula on how to calculate it. So you can find it right there. 
hope I answered that question. Karma? That was a great question, though, because, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times people look at these and they're just like magic numbers that people just pulled out of thin air. And sometimes they are, but they often, more often not, come from actual uh, experience of what worked and also just normal physiology. Yeah, normal physiology is normal physiology, yeah. right? And Guyton is the, is the grandfather, the father, the, 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 the godfather of physiology. Um, his book on physiology is the Bible that uh, we all have studied and learned from. And it has, uh, that is probably one of my favorite textbooks to have ever read. It taught me so much about so many different things. Really amazing. So Guyton's Physiology, you can find it there. So I guess would you say the bottom line is that neither you or I are afraid of giving blood? An inappropriate I don't want to give it if I don't have to, right. but if I have to, I don't have any qualms about it. Um, I, I, I do not disagree that blood transfusions are expensive. I do not disagree that blood transfusions carry risk. Um, and I do not disagree with blood transfusions should be avoided to the degree possible. But I also believe that excessive anemia is expensive. Excessive anemia is potentially uh, carries with it tremendous risk for uh, morbidity and mortality. And uh, that severe anemia should be avoided um, as much as is possible. And somewhere in between all of that is where the right place is to take blood transfusions away from cardiac surgery, which uses 20 to 25 percent of the nation's is. blood supply, mm -hmm. would be tantamount to uh, excluding massive amounts of patients' uh, eligibility for cardiac surgery. Um, however, giving blood to patients on an algorithm where you say, I'm not going to come off, I'm not going to let the hematocrit fall below 28 and I'm just going to give everybody blood would be misguided and inappropriate. We have to be sensible about this. And I think that reducing our circuit size would be hugely beneficial. Look, I just had an incident occur, what you got? I just had an incident occur at a hospital patient was 147 kilos i was gonna have to flow five and a half six liters a minute for this patient that wasn't their ideal body they were big patient big patient not uncommon for us to see and they wanted to know what our churro cannula i wanted we have a 21 and we have a 24 and i said i never use a 24 use a 21 and they were like are you sure that seems awfully small i said use a 21 21 is big enough for this patient and so they were, they were like, okay, we'll, we'll use the 21. And one of my colleagues that I work with, the surgeon said, you know, if I had suggested this to so-and-so, mm -hmm. um, he would have probably had a stroke. Yeah. But we're going to, 21, you say 21. 21 is fine. Just make sure you put it in the and right spot. I, yes. Oh, it's all about placement, right. But I measured the, flow, the pressures, of course, and my line pressure never really exceeded 240 at mm -hmm. six liters of flow, which I know is very well tolerated because if you've ever done port access or heart port or whatever they call it, whatever iteration of that abomination yeah. is, um, you had basically, you were almost using a 14 French because you had to put the balloon through the arterial cannula and the femoral. You had almost no room at all. You had line Blue, pressures yeah. of 400, yeah. even Blue. more than 400 peaking over that. So I know that it can be done and, and, and uh, uh, having a, uh, our hero line pressure of 240 or 250 is of no concern to me at all. And it worked just fine. Well, are we not making the same mistake with our circuits? Should we be, you, you know, th because of the length of our tubing, I think we need to get them a lot shorter than we do. I don't know what the solution for that is. The pump is back here, positioning and stuff. Using 3 8 venous line, every cc of volume in any Counts. tube. Exactly is a CC you do not have in your reservoir volume. And we have to have a minimum level in the reservoir. So saving volume everywhere really, really matters. And uh, 
being as judicious as we can. Look, we draw labs. I can't tell you how many times I'll ask anesthesia for a, a blood gas. We use the gem and we use a hemocron and they'll hand me 10 cc's, eight cc's, six cc's of blood. And I'll look at them and I'll say, really? I mean, I only need a half a cc. Why are you giving me this? And four cc's maybe doesn't sound like very much, but four cc's times 50 is going to be 200 cc's. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be a lot. And so we do a lot of labs. We have to be aware of this and we have to be extremely careful. What comes to the pump sucker? What goes to the cell saver? All of that matters. You're bleeding and you're, you're, they have a hole in a vessel and it's shooting blood up in the air and it's landing on the drapes where you're never gonna be able to reclaim it. And I have no problem saying, can you just put your finger on the hole for a second until you've got everything ready instead of letting it just bleed over on the drape? Mm -hmm. Let's all think about every little thing and we can truly reduce blood transfusions, but we cannot eliminate them. It is not possible and it would be misguided and irresponsible of anyone to try to do so. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joe. That was brilliant. Um, that was really brilliant. So what we're saying is, to, I tried to look up your, um, your initial part of your talk. Yes. Where you were talking about measured quality outcomes. Yes. And so the, the reality of cardiac surgery, we're looking for three big things. There's actually four. Uh, the big three things are we want the patients to leave the hospital quick. We want them off the ventilator quick. And we want to decrease. Mm -hmm. uh, Throw the slides up. Decrease transfusions. Um, and we want to, and the other big thing that we want to decrease, which you, the, all of these things are, look like they are complications. So the big four, it's decrease complications, uh, get the patient out of the hospital quick, get them out of the vent quick, and decrease um, blood transfusions. And those, those are the big four. Um, I think what you've talked about today and, and how we've covered this, the, how we've covered albumin in particular and when to give blood and when not to give blood and certainly not to be afraid of giving blood has answered your first questions of our measured quality outcomes that we can improve and make and have a benefit to these outcomes and still give blood. Mm -hmm. I agree 100 percent and give new blood. Don't accept blood that is 37 <laughs> days yes. old. Just because you I have the sent VA it, or something like that. I've sent it back blood. to the blood bank. No, you know what? Give me yeah. something that's four or five days old. Take that's what I do. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Give this patient the best blood we can possibly give yep. them. But regardless, blood is just an essential part of cardiac surgery. Not ever, unless you just only want to do single vessel off pump cabbages on otherwise healthy patients that um, the likelihood of them ever needing transfusions during the surgery is minimal to the, to the degree of unreasonable. Um, and that's, that's your cardiac surgery program. You will not have a cardiac surgery program. Yep. Not certainly one that's robust. If you haven't liked and subscribed yet, take the time to do that right now. <laughs> I love Find when you do. Find that button somewhere. There. They're going to love you. Those guys are going to love you. <laughs> yes, like and subscribe. I never do that. I'm not self-promoting in that regard. Like and subscribe. Everybody has to do that. And you know what else? I need 999,000 people to buy our app. That's right. I Ooh. want to retire. It's, it's only two ninety nine. It is. It's a fantastic app. I, I have a lot of fun with it because more than I actually use it because I actually try to predict what's going to happen and then I use the app and then I see what really happened. It's, it's a lot of fun. Look, it's app. got way more stuff on that yeah. app than any yeah, other app that a, exists. It's a great app. It really is. I, I was very impressed. For $2.99, that's what you charge? Yes. That's, that's and for the, for the drug calculator, it's only $0.99 cents on a separate, but you get that in the full app. So, and, uh, and Vicky developed the drug calculator. I, uh, I developed the uh, app for the uh, perfusion app, but we added them together. So we have a competition. Who's going to sell the most apps? And I'm not sure where we are on that right now, but all I know is I need to sell a million of them. I think we've sold a thousand. I need 999,000 more. And then you can retire. Really would appreciate well, everybody would buying them. that a big loss to the community, perfusion community when you retire or if you were to retire because you sold 900,000 of these things. So, but still go ahead and buy the app. I, I, I guess I would take three, that hit. Three, that and app a, is a good three and a half years, dude. I ain't doing this past 70. No, three and a half no, years no, and I'm out. Don't say that. <laughs> All right. I just got here. That's okay. Why are you going to do this to me? You get three years with me. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you all.